Yeah, we don't want to do anything to scare your children. That's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to scare anybody. What is the location? Walk away from there, okay? Hello and welcome back to the second episode of the week. And this is Stolen From Me and I'm your host, Lindsay. So today's episode, we're going to travel all the way to South Africa. And this episode come with a huge listener discretion. We're going to cover ser- various different trigger warnings. And at the time of in the episode, when it happens, I'm going to actually give you another warning. But we're going to cover rape, sexual violence and attempted murder. This is a very emotional episode and if you watch the documentary and read our book you'll definitely agree with me. So today's case is Alison Botha, B-O-T-H-A. Port Elizabeth, South Africa is one of the largest cities in South Africa. Alison Botha was just 27 years old when her whole life changed. One moment she was enjoying herself with her friends and the next she was being abducted at knife point. Alison spent the day at the beach with her friends. They decided to go back to hers, have some pizza and play some video games. It was just past midnight and her friend wanted to go home. Alison offered her a lift. On the way back, Alison couldn't park in her usual parking space so she decided to park a little bit further down not too far but still not where she wanted to park as Alison was leaning over her car seat to grab her washing which she'd just done around her friends she heard a low toned voice this voice said move over or I'll kill you he got in the car and drove off He did say, I don't want to hurt you, I just need your car for an hour. When Alison was younger, she grew up with the mindset thinking that she wasn't anything special. As a child, she didn't have any great dreams or aspirations. She didn't think she was going to be anything other than just average. But this story will show you just how far from average she really is. When Alison was older, she decided to go travelling for four years around the world. When she returned to South Africa, her mother was so relieved that she was home safe. The 18th of December 1994, 24-year-old Alison was arriving back home from her friends. She parked up and then she heard a noise. Then she felt a knife against her throat. Alison moved over to the passenger seat and the man drove off with her in the car. He turned to Alison and said, I don't want to hurt you, I just need your car. He went on to say that his name was Clifton and he just chatted about random stuff. He actually gave Alison a false sense of security. Clinton asked, do you have a boyfriend? Alison didn't really feel threatened by this. She did turn to Clinton and asked, if you want to just take my car and let me go. But Clinton didn't reply. The car stopped and another man got in. Alison looked at him through the mirror and said, she felt scared. His eyes were stone cold. Nothing there like dead, cold and evil. Alison knew there and then she wouldn't be going home. They then drove into darkness and pulled over on the beach. He asked, are you gonna fight? Alison didn't know what to say. She didn't know how to fight. She definitely didn't know how to fight against two men. Now this is where the trigger warning come in, so please beware. Clinton forced Alison to have oral sex with him and then he did the same to her. He then raped her. Alison said her body responded. She felt betrayed by her own body. Now I just want everyone to know that your rape isn't less serious if your body has a natural defense reaction to it. I'm gonna leave links below to that as well. 
Franz, Tien shouts. He then, ca- he then came over. There and then she knew his name wasn't Clinton. Franz said, Do you want to have sex with the lovely lady? Tien said, No, I want to fuck the bitch. Franz said, You can't talk to her like that. She's a lady. You have to talk to her properly. When Tien got on top of Alison, she felt his hands tightly around her throat. She blacked out. Tien's raped Alison. Then he started to stab Alison in the abdomen and pubic area. It's said that she was stabbed 36 times. When they saw Alison wasn't dead, Tien's then went to cut Alison's throat. Then Franz came over on top of Alison and started slicing. She said that she looked up and could see that Franz was over the top of her as he was slicing her throat the moon actually ironically gave him a halo Franz sliced Alison's throat 17 times and walked off they both got in the car and threw Alison's clothes Alison said she couldn't feel any pain she did however hear her own breathing it was frightful and loud Alison was breathing through her severed windpipe. She had a gaping hole through and above her collarbone. Alison felt overwhelmingly sad when she realised she was dying. She remembered the feeling of her leaving her own body. Alison saw herself lying on the sand. She couldn't no longer hear her own breathing. The next thing she felt was she had a choice. She could stay there and die on the sand or she could go back into her body and fight. Alison chose to live. If she wasn't going to make it, she wanted to make sure that this would happen to nobody else. So she wrote in the sand the names of the men that did this, Franz and Tiens. Alison also wrote in the sand, I love you, Mum. Alison felt wet all down her leg and then she realised she'd been disemboweled. Her small intestines were on the outside of her body. She grabbed a denim shirt what was just close by and she wrapped it around her stomach. She held her intestines in with a shirt that was covered in sand and she crawled over sand, ash and glass. She wanted to make it to the road. She wanted to make sure that her mother didn't have any answered questions. Alison tried so hard to crawl, but it wasn't going so well for her. Every bit of fight she had left in her body, she was using She had to make it to the road. So she managed to get herself up onto her feet and then she remembered everything just going black. She then put her hand on her throat where they were cutting and she realised her whole hand went into her neck. They severed her muscle that is on the side of her neck. Then... She realised that her head had fallen all the way back to her shoulder blades and this is why it all went black. She was looking up to the sky. So not only did she have to walk losing a rapid amount of blood, her intestines been on the outside of her body, but her throat being slashed 17 times that her neck had fell to her shoulder blades. Her shirt was covered in so much sand and debris. She now knew that she had to hold one hand on her head and one hand on her tummy. Alison said that she remembers at this point she felt like someone had had picked her up and moved her, who was helping her, guiding her to the road. The next thing Alison remember was she was standing at the road. She collapsed on the floor. She could see some kind of light. It was a car. She thought to herself, 
Franz and Tien could be in that car, but she couldn't do anything about that. She was just stuck on the road. As the car got closer and closer, she could see it more clearly. It got so close and then it just spun off and left her. Luckily, Alison didn't have to wait too much longer as another car came along and this time it stopped. A man got out. Tian, not Tien. Tian is a 20-year-old veterinarian doctor or student doctor, shall we say. He was on holiday with his friends and then he saw Alison and he grabbed her hand and he looked her straight in the eye. Her eyes were covered in blood and he told her she had beautiful eyes. He stayed with her the whole time. He covered her up, kept reassuring her, everything's going to be all right. This was a time in the 90s where not a lot of people had mobile phones, but luckily his friend did. They called for an ambulance and they had to wait around 40 minutes for this ambulance to actually arrive. Tian actually went into the ambulance with Alison and he held her hand the whole time. He never let go of her hand the whole time. Now he said he remember actually telling the ambulance drivers to hurry up because he felt they were driving really slow, like she wasn't going to make it, so what's the point? They got to the hospital and there was two doctors that actually worked with Alison. The doctor said, or Dr Cummings said, Alison's injuries were horrendous. He explained that in all the time he's worked in a doc- as a doctor, he'd never seen anything like it. And you could tell by his face that this really affected him on another level. Alison's injuries, her neck was cut from ear to ear. Her windpipe was showing. She had a clear cut through her throat and the hole was so big that it was just popping up above her collarbone. A student doctor told the other doctor, Dr Cummins, that that's not everything. He pulled back the covers and revealed that Alison's abdomen was actually showing she was dis- disemboweled. Not only was she nearly decapitated, she was disemboweled. Her intestines, lower, small intestines, were sitting on the outside of her tummy. Now, Alison's injuries were covered in sand, charcoal and ash and they were worried that they were going to be contaminated so badly that she'd actually get an infection. Tien and Franz had stabbed Alison so badly in the pubic area that they believed that Alison would never have children if she actually survived. The general surgeon made a decision to take control and he believed that he could do this, he could fix Alison. The surgeon was blown away by how Alison actually wrote on the consent form her name clearly and not only did she do that, she actually wrote her mother's phone number down and wrote mum beside her. If you think of how badly she was hurt and then for them to say that, Now the other doctor, he worked on the abdominal and he meticulously cleaned and scrubbed and he actually used a scrubbing brush to get every single piece of sand and charcoal out of Alison's body, all the inside and out on the small intestines because he was so worried about her getting an infection. Actually, they describe Alison as a miracle. With Alison's injuries, the reason why they say, or one of the reasons why they say she's a miracle is because the blood vessels that supply the blood to the brain, they wasn't damaged, and if they was, she would have hemorrhaged and died in four minutes. Also, Alison was stabbed in the chest, and her lungs and heart was not even damaged. An investigating officer came to the hospital They wanted to find out who did this to Alison. They had a folder in their hand with mugshots in. As the officer was turning the pages to see or show Alison different shots of these people, they came across two photos. One was Franz and one was Tien's. And she wrote on a piece of paper, Franz and Tien's did it. 
The police officer on the case seemed okay with this. He went away, but then had to later come back because the chief prosecutor said that the prosecution case would be much stronger if Allison could verbally say the names of the two suspects. Now, the doctor in charge was completely appalled. He was not having any of it. He'd just put a, thro- uh, a tube down Allison's throat to help her breathe, and taking it out could cause infection and a whole lot more, so he just didn't want her to do it. But he actually said to Allison, What do you think? And she wrote on a piece of paper, Take it out. They did this, and the first thing Allison said was, That's wonderful. My attackers are Franz and Tiens. Time passed and then Alison was actually allowed to, allowed to have visitors. Then she was eventually allowed to go home. Alison wrote a thank you note in the newspaper to everyone who helped her, who sent her flowers and sent her cards. She was so grateful and overwhelmed with the kindness that she just wanted to thank everyone together. Alison, when she was able to go home, although she was home, She had to go back every single day to get her injuries cleaned up. They actually had to scrape the abdomen until it bled so new cells could actually grow. Alison said recovery was so hard and she was in constant pain. There was two other ladies raped by Franz and Tiens. One lady was so scared to come forward, she waited a whole week. It's believed that she was threatened and they said that they would kill her if she'd go to the police. The second lady was pregnant, but she didn't wait. She ran straight to the police and told them what happened. The police took Franz in and charged him and Tien with attempted murder. Now, when Franz was actually told attempted murder, Melvin then said, Alison's alive, Fran. He was so shocked, he could actually have fell off his chair. Franz then said, well, there isn't anything I could hide, is there? She'll tell you everything they need to tell you. Then Franz actually handed Melvin a ring off his finger. This still had Alison's blood on it. And he said, this ring is Alison's. Alison had to see a clinical psychologist. She had been assessed before the trial, but the psychologist wanted to actually get her to be emotional about what happened to her. But Alison just wasn't ready. She couldn't face what had happened to her and she definitely wasn't going to do it now. They gave her a pillow and said, you know, you have to take out your anger on this. And she actually punched it. Alison punched the pillow, but she said that she wasn't punching it about what happened. She was punching it because they were actually making her angry. Now, the law back in the 90s was the fact that the, the victim had to go up to the perpetrator in a lineup and actually put their hand on them and then have their photo taken with them and say, this is the person that did it. And the photo backed up that they actually picked that person. But Melvin was so supportive to Alison, he didn't want her to go through any more trauma. And he actually made the decision that the first time in South Africa, Alison would not have to do this. She would be able to look through a one-way glass. And that's exactly what she did. So they wouldn't be able to see her, she'd be able to see them and then she could identify her attackers. This is exactly what we do now, but this was obviously back in the 90s. Alison was terrified, but brave. Then she said, number six, number 13. Melvin said to Fran and Tian before they actually went to court, I'm not gonna handcuff you because I want you to run. Make my day and run. He states, because if you run, I'm going to shoot you. I think Melvin is on the same wavelength as most people there. At the trial, when Alison bravely gave evidence, she stated that she's always thought her neck was her strongest feature for her appearance. 
and look at her neck now. So many people who were involved in this case said they will never, ever be able to forget this case. Not like the other cases they deal with. They just wouldn't be able to get this one out of their head. It was so bad. Friends gave evidence and testified, stating that he was, in fact, a Satanist. Friends believed in Satan. I don't expect anything else. Although the argument didn't really hold up in court, no one really believed what he was saying. A pastor was actually brought in to see if this was true, and it was proven that it wasn't. He was just talking shit. Now, not only does Fran and Tien, but Fran ruined the life of these women. He's now ruined his father's life because it's said that his dad, Fran's dad, committed suicide because he couldn't handle what his son had done. The judge, Chris Jansen, when making this decision for the sentence, he did fairly and took into consideration the previous rape cases. He wanted to sentence him so much so what he did was he wrote on a document and made it recorded so when they went to prison that the prison officers and when they wanted to go for parole that this would be on their records and he stated that these two posed such a threat to society they should never ever be released. Alison said that she found the media really tough to handle. Alison, after the trial, said that she couldn't fix her soul. Alison suffered understandably from depression. Alison struggled so much so that she actually moved back in with her mother. But her mother really didn't mind because she really wanted to care for Alison. Alison needed care all the time. She needed to keep her wounds cleaned and she needed bed baths. And her mum would do this for her because what care a mother wouldn't do this. Alison had a bath for the very first time in a long time. She stood in front of a mirror and looked at herself. She saw scars. Alison's depression got worse. Then a letter arrived through the door. She was invited to give a talk. Although this wasn't Alison's thing, she really didn't do anything like this. She didn't even do it at school. So why would she stand up and talk to however many people? Alison did end up going as she really didn't want to say no because she felt like they supported her. But what this talk did, which she really didn't expect, was it made her feel better. She enjoyed it. She wanted to keep going. This gave Alison a direction and purpose. Alison started to heal. Alison got to travel all over the world. You can actually find Alison's talks online and YouTube. Alison said ABC is her way of dealing with trauma. A is for attitude, B is for belief, and C is for choice. Alison read in the newspaper that Franz and Tiens might come up for parole. Even though the advice from the judge was never to be allowed out, Alison fell into a deep depression. Everyone was affected by this. Alison was petrified that they might be released. Then one day, unbelievably, a woman from America actually emailed Alison saying, her daughter was actually having a relationship with Franz while he's in prison and she was actually his fiancée. The cheek of the lady actually asked Alison for help. Apparently Franz has a Facebook and that's how they got talking and they even go on these random sex rooms. Alison wrote to the authorities saying that what the hell is going on basically she was saying that please don't use her name please don't let them know where this information come from but how come he's got a girlfriend or a fiance and why is he using facebook and these chat rooms and she stated do not tell them where this information come from alison found out not only did franz know that she told them 
but the email was printed out and actually handed to friends. Now, if it's actually possible for friends to get any worse than he even is right now, I don't think you can get any worse, but... Friends requested an interview with the filmmaker. In return, he had demands. He wanted a letter of forgiveness from Alison. Profits and shares from the book and talks that Alison had given, and he wanted them backdated. Franz believed that he did what he did to Alison is the reason why she has a success story. Franz's request was denied. Alison, as a child, believed she was average, nothing special. Alison went on not only to be a miracle, but she went on to have two sons, which doctors believed would never happen. Alison is far from average. Now, Tian, not Tian, Tian, the veterinarian doctor or student doctor that actually found Alison on the road and stayed with her until she went into surgery. He actually decided to become a doctor. From seeing Alison there in the road, he made up his mind and he became a doctor. He actually assisted with the birth of Alison's second child. Alison just said that she loved being pregnant. On the 7th of August 1995, Franz was sentenced to three life term sentences with no parole. Tiens was sentenced to one life term sentence and 25 years and no parole. In October 2015, they became eligible for parole. I can't find any information out on whether they actually got released from prison or not. I hope to God for Alison's sake and all women that they are never ever to be released. Thank you for listening to today's case of Alison Botha, The Survival Story. I don't think Alison is average one bit. Now I'll see you on Sunday for our next episode. We're now doing twice weekly, so I will see you on Sunday. I hope you all take care and don't forget to click on the links if you need them in my description below. Thank you. Goodbye. No one wants to go to jail for things.